Health. And we are, sorry, it usually doesn't say that. <laughs> it's okay, <laughs> no worries. Um, we're excited to be here as part of the Know Your City series. So very grateful that Meg invited us to, to be part of it. Please do ask questions anytime. I've got a short slideshow and feel free to ask questions during the slideshow. And then certainly if more come to you as we wrap up, feel free to, to send them along. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Here we are. Neighborhood services. So um, again, I work in neighborhood services at the city of Fort Collins. And we have about six areas of focus. The one I'll mostly talk about tonight is neighborhood administration, because that is our programs. And that is what I know the most about. But I am going to mention some of the other areas and people who work in neighborhood services. So in neighborhood administration, that includes the people on programs like myself. It also includes our customer service admin people, and that's Katie and Jen and Lori. And when one would call or email neighborhood services, you often reach one of them and they field all kinds of questions from um, I want to register a party to I'm questioning something getting buried in the yard across the street to um, I'm wondering about this neighborhood development sign that's popping up. So all kinds of questions come to our come to our admin team and they are very savvy at making sure those questions are triaged to the appropriate people. We and programs do a lot of education and outreach programs, and I will go deeper into those this evening. Lots of community engagement and getting neighbors proactively involved in things going on in their neighborhoods. Problem solving, meeting facilitation, a lot of different events, which I'll talk about those as well. Grant funding is something I work very closely on, and I'm excited to answer any questions you might have about our mini grants program. And also some special projects, a lot of them come up as priorities from our city council members. And I will tell you a little bit about those too. Code compliance is another area in our, in our department, code compliance, also does a lot of outreach. They are the experts in knowing what city codes are and whether city codes change. And those codes may be about um, weed and pest management in our neighborhoods. It might be about occupancy in some of, um, in some of the homes and rentals throughout our community. They are very proactive. I think they maybe about 96% or 98% of the times that they work with residents, there is voluntary compliance and there's never any kinds of fines or things that come up. So they do a lot of conversations and education when there is something to inspect. The snow shoveling is a big one that after big storms, we get questions about shoveling sidewalks and so they're they're out and about inspecting 24 hours later if um, our sidewalks are safe. Justin Moore and Jay Hernandez are the two people to contact in are our two leads in code compliance. We also have mediation and restorative justice in neighborhood services. Again, lots of outreach with CSU, with PSD, lots of volunteers who work in mediation. And they're actually accepting applications for new volunteers to help with community mediation. They can facilitate meetings. They um, have a very strong restorative justice program that's being modeled in, in other um, community partner organizations. And they also apply for grants to do some of the work that they do in our community. And Perry McMillan is the the lead there in mediation and restorative justice. And then I have to add, hopefully you can see this okay on your screen, but um, special events 
has been in neighborhood services for a few years now. They're actually moving to emergency preparedness and the security department. This is um, a lot of this move. There are many reasons for this move, but one of the reasons is as we come out of pandemic times and how we um, manage all of the pieces of special events. And so the permitting and planning and guidance. So they're gonna live, special events is gonna live in that department, but we're still gonna work with them super closely. And I will talk about a few specifics uh, as, we, as we move on with these slides, but we have very amazing experts in special events, Aaron Marganau and a new lead event specialist, Ella V. And they're willing to answer any number of questions and be a good resource and help with event planning in our city, especially again, as we come, come into um, new times from, from the past year. And just so you know, there are events that are that are appearing and being approved and will be on calendars this year, including the Taste of Fort Collins and the Fortitude 10K. So you will, you will see some events like those coming back this year. Any questions about these four areas before I move to the next slide? I don't see anything coming through, Julie. Okay, thank you, Meg. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a lot of talking right now, but I, I won't I won't do that with every slide. And two more two more areas to mention. We have a neighborhood development liaison. That's Alyssa Stevens, and she works closely with neighborhood services and with planning. Again, lots of education outreach, lots of proactive meetings. So if you imagine neighborhoods where Maybe there's a new brewery coming in or a new mobile home park being considered or um, all of the all of the community involvement around Hughes Stadium, those kinds of decision making, that kind of engagement, Alyssa's involved with things like that. So she's a key person with communication. She wants neighbors engaged before something happens versus after some kind of development happens. And she is great at facilitating meetings. She's our neighborhood development liaison. And then we also have a community liaison, J.R. Rieskamp, and she works closely with neighborhood services and Colorado State University campus life. So she does a lot of work in our neighborhoods that are especially a mix of long-term residents and college students. And JR is the person who would be um, organizing community welcome, which was a little different last year. We'll see what happens going forward. And that's the event where lots of information is shared, again, between long-term residents and CSU students, things like you know, party registrations, um, noise considerations, um, considering that your student neighbors may work, you know, late night shifts and things, just different schedules, really just being a good middle person for relationships in between um, city and Colorado State. I'd like to tell you about our mini grants program. And this is something that I focus on a lot in my position as a program coordinator. Has anyone here heard of our mini grants program? I have. <laughs> Good, all right. Well, I will, I will tell you a little bit more about it. We are, in round two, round one has already occurred and awards have already gone out. Round two, the application is open right now. The focus is sustainability, which is a broad focus. And we can certainly help brainstorm a lot of different ideas can encompass sustainability. A few questions maybe to prompt you are just, you know, thinking of activities and projects that better connect neighbors, maybe thinking about how youth can participate this round. 
The grant awards are up to $1,000. Applications are due July 1st. The projects that um, the grants are for take place between August 1st and November 20th. I've included the website here and the website includes frequently asked questions and the application is there in English and in Spanish. And gosh, all kinds of ideas come up for these mini grants. We see lots of um, cleanups. We see leaf cleanups. We see hazardous waste collection cleanups. We see um, workshops. We see garden swaps. We see food trucks and um, making communication um, trees or networks or lists just to better connect neighbors. We see bike parades and um, getting bike helmets to the youth in the community, things like that. There's really all kinds of ideas and we have dozens and dozens of ideas that we can access through the website or happy to brainstorm with you too. These, these little libraries that some of them during the pandemic turned into little pantries, those, those are great grant project ideas too. So um, yeah, think workshops, rain barrel workshops, things that would matter to your neighborhood, projects that would matter to your neighborhood and connect your neighbors. So again, um, the application is due July 1st, and I am happy to field all questions on mini grants. Are any coming through, Meg? Not yet, um, but I have a question. Yeah. What, what makes a neighborhood a neighborhood? Are there, um, can you answer that? <laughs> yes, that is an excellent question, Meg. Um, we believe neighborhoods can self-define. There are, I want to say, 150 to 180 neighborhood names in Fort Collins um, that might have, you know, signs in their neighborhoods that um, maybe they're, they're HOA um, affiliated neighborhoods or, or maybe not but we allow neighborhoods to self-define. So it might be, you know, a blend of a, a few areas. It might be, you know, a stretch of two or three blocks. It might be the, the few blocks surrounding a school or a, a shared park or some other kind of shared resource or, a, or even um, a church or um, a library. So we, we allow communities to self-define. We also get small community nonprofits that are very neighborhood-based apply for grants too. So, it, so our program is open to small community nonprofits or, or very small nonprofits that are very neighborhood-based. And I should also mention that our mini grant funding is only for uh, within the city limits. Sometimes we have special programs where we can extend into the growth management area, but this mini grant program and this round is for residents who res reside within the city limits. And is it this like one time a year that you open applications for grants? A good question, Meg. So we, we have two rounds this year. One already occurred, and this is the second one. So also glad you asked that, Meg, because in the past, there have um, sometimes been three grant rounds. One of them focused on neighborhood night out. But in the pandemic times and um, coming out, we are not having a grant round focused on neighborhood night out. But if you have a community or neighborhood who wants to plot something in honor of Neighborhood Night Out and wants to apply for a mini grant, this is the round to apply. Awesome, thanks. Sure. Any other mini grant questions? So I guess um, I'm wondering, you know, you mentioned uh, projects like having hazardous waste cleanup or something. Does the money 
go to um, like a contractor or does it actually involve like people from the neighborhood coming out and cleaning up like a ugly empty field or something anything like that it could it could be either i mean sometimes i'm i'm not sure if that's the answer you were hoping for but it really could be um it could be either there could be funds that go toward the contractor with the pickup truck who's going to be there and while neighbors load up um hazardous waste that may have been in the garage or um, basement or side of the house or something and take it over to the landfill. Or it could be um, maybe there's a neighbor who's putting in the sweat equity to use their truck and take the load over to the landfill, but you want to get cocoa and donuts for all the neighbors who participate or you want to get um, something that would be a helpful thing for neighbors. Um, sometimes people really kind of collect a few um, things to share with neighbors maybe or, or get a food truck to come and have a cleanup day and get rid of hazardous waste and pass out shower timers and um coupons for for um you know uh local business and um swap out porch lights or it, you could really really in your um application say you know we're planning this activity two hundred dollars is going to go towards this we're going to spend you know $50 on cocoa and donuts, and we're going to do, um, you know, get shower timers for, you know, the 60 people, 60 households who participate or something. So, yeah, um, yeah definitely options there and happy to think out loud with people who are interested in, you know, working on that application. In the past, we've had, um, workshops to help people fill out the application. And I do have to say, we try to make the application as simple as possible, but I understand that um, still completing one, you know, you want to be set up for success and make sure you answer it thoroughly. So happy to think out loud with anyone who's interested in applying. Awesome. Um, I have had a question come in from uh, attendee. Uh, okay. Can I can a neighborhood apply for more than one grant as long as the total doesn't exceed $1,000? A neighborhood can apply for more than one grant. Sometimes we try to pair neighbors up together for something like neighborhood night out. If it's literally like neighbors who are one block apart or something, we see if they can combine efforts and things like that. But um but really, um, yeah, more than one, a neighborhood can apply for more than one grant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't see any more questions right now. Okay, thanks, Meg. Yeah. The other program I wanted to mention is our Sustainable Neighborhoods Program. And this has been a pilot program. And we have four neighborhoods that have participated so far. They are Parkwood East, Warren Lake, Moore, and Oak Ridge Eighth Filing. And they have gotten together and built an email list and shared contact information and planned events and workshops and activities that focus on these five goal areas, air, water, land, energy, and people. And so what happens is they earn credits for the activities they do, and then they can become a certified sustainable neighborhood in Fort Collins. And if you've been through any of these neighborhoods, you see they do have a they do have signs in their neighborhood that look like this green city of Fort Collins logo sign with a sustainable neighborhood network on it and their neighborhood's name on it. And um, yeah, and you can continue year after year if you wish to participate in this program. 
it will open again next spring. There's potential that we might try to do like a shortened version that we'd open in the fall, but um, stay tuned, stay tuned to the website if we ever do a condensed version. But in the meantime, on our website, we do share all of the ideas for activities and workshops. And we often refer people there, even if they're not interested in the sustainable neighborhood program, just for ideas for some of those mini grant ideas. So for instance, an air project might be making a carpool network in your neighborhood or converting some of your neighborhood's gas powered lawn equipment into electric um, lawn equipment. Maybe a water project would be a big neighborhood mulch day because that's going to reduce um, evaporation and keep keep our gardens um, moist. Maybe it's a rain barrel workshop for a land project. Maybe there's again like a household hazardous waste collection or alternative pest management kind of workshop for an energy project. There could be. Um, dark sky efforts in trying to change out some of the neighborhood lighting, porch lights, etc., to be dark sky compliant. Maybe it's um, a time of day power check and we have changed now to the May to October um, power energy usage timing. So um, maybe it's some neighborhood efforts on, on reaching goals there. And then for people, maybe maybe it's neighborhood clubs, uh, helping hands club, um, community asset inventory, and you you keep track of what talents are in your neighborhood. And maybe you have neighbors who can help with landscaping, and neighborhood neighbors who can help with childcare, and neighbors who can help with um, publishing, and neighbors who can help with um, harvest swaps and recipe swaps and things like that. So kind of taking inventory of the talents in your very own neighborhood and, and putting them to use and, and sharing those skills. So that is our Sustainable Neighborhoods Program. It's relatively new. There are a few cities in Colorado that are part of this network. And if you want to think about that for the future, think about applying or just learn more about the, the cool activities and workshop ideas, please visit our website, which I've included here. Any questions on sustainable neighborhoods? I don't see anything coming through. But... Super, Meg, you're doing a good job. Thank you for watching that. <laughs> of course, yeah. Who here has heard of our block party trailer? Anyone? I have. Good. <laughs> but I bet everyone. I bet you get our newsletters, don't you, Meg? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think good. I heard someone chime in and say they, yay, Eileen has. Good, good, good. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, we probably, yeah, have told Eileen about it too. Um our block trailer. So this is a party in a box. It is a trailer filled with yard games, tables, chairs, recycling bins, coolers um hand sanitizer essentials so that if you are wanting to get your neighbors together but it seems like an overwhelming task or you don't want to have to rent tables and street blockades because that we saw so often going to um block party events and mini grant funds going to that the, the party trailer comes with street blockades and it comes with an inflatable movie screen and projector. These are all free to, to rent and use in your neighborhood for weekends over the summer. It's open now. It's open June, July, August, September weekends. There might be a little bit of blocked dates um, around major holidays. But if you are interested in getting this for your neighborhood, and you can always opt for just the block party trailer or just the inflatable movie screen and projector or ask for both, it's, it's a free resource. Code Compliance drops it off at your house and they pick it up on uh, Monday morning. And there are some COVID um, 
cleaning protocol to follow, but otherwise it is a party in your party in a box that arrives on your street and you get your neighbors together and it it hopefully makes that easier to do so. Questions about the block party trailer. Um, I don't see any, but I am, that is the coolest thing I knew. I mean, I'd heard of it, but I didn't know that it came with all of that cool stuff. It's yeah. pretty fun. Um, so when you register for this or um, reserve it, do you at the same time have to get a permit for a block party or? Yes, yes you do. Super question and I'm glad you asked it. I was gonna mention that too, but it's better that you asked it, Meg. Yes, it does require a special event permit. And this is one of the um, places where I mentioned how we still work very closely with special events to get the permit and apply for the block party trailer and or the movie screen projector, you would you would go through special events. You can reach them through our web page and that's listed on the bottom there with the with the check it out and everything. But um, it does those reservations and the permitting do um, happen through special events. Okay. And how long does it take for like the time you um, submit your special events permit for something mm -hmm. like this? Mm -hmm. Like how, how much say, advanced do you have to plan? Oh yeah. I mean it's it's already um it's already quite popular. So I think if you have an inclination or want to go right now and text all your neighbors and say we're picking between this weekend and this weekend and apply for it, I would I would urge you to apply soon. And I think you'll hear back um, within a few days. They are getting a lot of requests. And um, in the past, sometimes they were, you know, maybe allowing one neighborhood to have it on a Friday and one to have it on a Saturday. I'm not entirely sure that's happening right now. Aaron or LED and special events will know better. And it might be related to COVID cleaning protocol. But um, yeah, it's it's pretty popular. And maybe even if um, you want one or the other, the, the party trailer or the movie screen, even that, I would apply um, quite soon to do so. Yeah, yeah. Good absolutely. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed yeah. it, um, gaining popularity since COVID? It, yeah, I think it has. And I think, um, you know, it, it we, um, we, we got it, um, really just for that summer before. And then um, we had the pandemic and couldn't couldn't share it. And so now it's back. And I think people were pretty excited to see it come back. And yeah, it's got cornhole and badminton and footballs and frisbees and Jenga. And it's, um, yeah, it's it just makes getting together with neighbors easier because it's not putting all of that work on, um, all of those funds to to bring those items to have a have a block party. So, um, yeah, put in your put in your request now. Yeah, um, great question from Lynn. Um, okay, which should be done first? Reserve the trailer, then get the permit, or apply for the permit? Then, when the permit is approved, see if the trailer is still available. I would, as much as you can, do them both at the same time. And I think, um, yeah, apply for the permit for your party and um, apply for the block party trailer. And in each application, you can say, I'm requesting the trailer or I've submitted for a permit. And they'll, they'll see them. They'll be able to match them in special events. Perfect. Um, and then I also she asked, is there a list of everything that's included in the trailer? Yes, there is. And that you can find on the on the website as well, the list of everything that's inside of it. And if you um, ever have more ideas of what would be a really helpful thing, I mean, there's flashlights in there because sometimes you're packing up and it's kind of gotten dark. And so, yeah, if you think of other things that would be helpful to include, let us know. But there is a list and it is on the website. 
That's awesome. Thanks. I think. Yeah. And spread the word. Yes. Or, or, or not if you're worried about yeah, totally. competing applications. But um, we're pretty happy we have it. And um, yeah, we hope someday maybe we have more than one. Yeah, that sounds awesome. And next, I'll talk a little bit about some of the equity work we're doing in neighborhood services. And JC Ward, my supervisor, who is the senior city planner, is mostly leading these efforts. And again, this work stems a lot from our city council priorities. So with our CARES Act funding, to address COVID-19 impacts, we were able to provide some mini grants to legal providers who were going to help people who might be um, facing more housing instability or eviction. So direct representation for, for, those, um, for those issues also grants for providers who could give know your rights workshops and those workshops might be for residents or property managers or owners and also legal clinic days which had bilingual staffing and interpretation services and were days with 30 minute drop in slots to again help people navigate some of the real puzzles and stresses that um, that came from increased housing instability during during the pandemic. So we had many grants for that. And right now being considered by our council as a legal defense fund for immigrants. And this is something that um, my supervisor is working closely with council on. 6.8% of Fort Collins residents are immigrants, 15% of children in Fort Collins live with at least one immigrant parent, and 75% of these children are themselves U.S. citizens. There are a lot of community partners working on this potential legal defense fund, and um, certainly any, any questions or wanting to learn more about that, um, I could I could direct you to JC with that or um, watch for the for the next city council meetings and um, work sessions that will that will dive deeper into the legal defense fund. Any any questions about those efforts? I don't see anything coming through right now. Okay, thanks, Meg. Yeah. Then also a big council priority is our mobile home communities. And council really wants to work on livability and safety in our mobile home communities and maintaining, maintaining these neighborhoods um, since they are considered affordable housing when we know that um, there is a great demand. So, so some of the um, benefits in working with our mobile home communities, privacy and single family housing lifestyle, private or semi-private outdoor areas and gardens, access to community amenities like pools and playgrounds, and a strong sense of community. Some of the challenges we see in working with these communities are frequent and unpredictable housing cost increases, housing instability and fear of potential community closure and displacement, difficulty and cost of moving homes, and power dynamics with the owners, operators, and limited tenant protections. So Emily, um, Emily Olivo is our neighborhood liaison, and she is focused on a lot of the work that is happening in our mobile home communities. New local and state laws have just been developed to protect mobile home park residents. And so listed here is the Colorado Mobile Home Park Dispute Resolution Program and the City of Fort Collins Mobile Home Park Complaint System. And more information, more questions, 
about these efforts, I've included the website here where you can um, you know, access it through our main neighborhood services website. Any, any questions about the mobile home community work? Um, not yet, but oh, maybe something will come through in a second. I guess I'm wondering what's the outreach look like to get um, these resources to the residents at mobile home parks? How aware are they of all these? Yeah, that, that's a super question, Meg. And um, I think some of the most effective outreach is using trusted community partners and great partners like the library. And there's a lot of door-to-door um, -door communication shared with the neighbors. Um, flyers, sometimes code compliance goes out with door hangers to, to update on, for instance, um, the dispute resolution program and the complaint system and things like that. Um, we have some community champions in many of these neighborhoods. And so we work closely with them to um, disseminate information as well and continue to look for good community champions and um, yeah, really make the most of partnerships and building, building relationships in these communities. Awesome. Oh, that sounds really important. Um, during uh, COVID, do you think these uh, mobile home park communities were hit harder? With some of the, you know, I mean, I, I don't have um, I mean, I guess statistics I mean, like, or data off the top of my head, but um, I think, I mean, we knew that, you know, we knew that, for instance, um, internet came up real quickly with um, access to internet and um, students going virtual, right? And there were many families I know who, um, you know, trying to stay connected to learning through cell phones or having to go to the one hotspot in their community to download an assignment go home to work on it, come back to upload it. I mean, so we learned a lot about, um, we learned a lot about um, needs, I think, during this time. Um, certainly the housing instability, I think um, we, um, we knew was increasing, you know, there were, um, there was different legislation regarding evictions and moratoriums and things like that during the pandemic. So um, there's, and there's, there's just other, there's some, some of the communities who have just like really, really old main water lines and, you know, you get a, you get a freeze and something comes up with one of the water lines. And so, um, Again, having having strong partnerships and community champions and and good communication in in our mobile home communities is so important. Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks for speaking to that. And I don't see any other questions coming through right now. Okay, I got two more slides then. I was just going to mention just a, a little bit more then about neighborhood services and our. Um, programming. So this last year we had a Martin Luther King Jr. vigil and maybe um, some of you participated in that or noticed them in the neighborhoods. There were little LED tea lights and luminaries set out to honor MLK. Uh, community welcome that happens with our liaison JR. This one was in 2019 and we get um, city staff and college students and police services and, you know, welcoming um, neighbors back, visiting long-term residents, welcoming students and just sharing good resources and information that happens at the start of every um, school year. It was a little different in 2020. It was a lot of door hangers and dropping magnets and materials and things like that. But we'll see what happens in 2021. The Adopt a Neighbor program is, um, is a neighborhood services program as well. That started as a, a snow shoveling 
kind of help your neighbor with shoveling program, but during the pandemic turned into being connected to neighbors who can pick up prescriptions or groceries and and other needs like that. So um, that is an evolving program, the Adopt a Neighbor program. And certainly if you want to volunteer to help neighbors or be connected with neighbors um, in, your, in your area that you may not know yet, you can, you can apply to, to be part of that program or apply to be matched with somebody who might help you with, with a task like that in the future. So those are just a few more um, examples of the types of programs we have in neighborhood services. And my last slide is some contact information. Our website again, I mentioned senior city planner, JC Ward, and that's her email. Emily Olivo, our neighborhood liaison, working a lot in the mobile home park communities. And that's her email. That's my name, Julie Wenzel, my email. We have a programs email in our main phone number and website. You can go to our website if you want to sign up for our seasonal e-newsletter and get a lot of updates on open applications, programs coming, um, volunteering to be a mediator, uh, learning about recycling. We, we share a number of things in our seasonal newsletters. So you can also sign up for those through our website. Yay. <laughs> um, does anyone have questions? Feel free to um, put them in the Q&A or um, you can take yourself off mute and ask. Uh, in the, oh, yay. you've got it, thank you. Um, so yeah, I hope you all learned a lot and mostly you have like gained an, a sense of the capacity of what neighborhood services is um, doing out in our community, which is so much stuff. Um, and I'm sure Julie, you've probably just like skimmed the top of a lot of these things. Uh, so I just really appreciate you taking the time to explain um, all these wonderful things. And I hope that folks feel inspired to take uh, advantage of the great programs and um, or reach out for more information. Julie's awesome and is definitely out in the community all the time. So I, I know she would be happy to help. Um, yeah, so we're gonna wrap up. I don't see any questions coming through. Uh, this is being recorded. And so we're gonna go ahead and post that on the library's YouTube channel. It's under the Know Your City playlist. And there's a couple other ones in there to watch as well. So you just want to, you know, revisit this because there was some information or you want to just see these um, contact emails that'll be posted. This video will be posted in a couple of days. Um, yeah, but I'm just so grateful. And thank you so much for being part of the Know Your City program series and explaining the awesome things that Neighborhood Services does. So thanks, Julie. Thank you, Meg. Thank you so much for inviting us to be part of the Know Your City series. And yes, please um, come to our website and see all the info there and contact me anytime with questions or to think out loud or to brainstorm, or I could come and talk to your neighbors to work on filling an application out together or whatever, um, whatever you need. We'd love to see cool new project ideas come through. And um, yeah, we get excited to meet more community champions. So I hope I, I hope I see you soon. Yeah, apply for those grants, guys. That sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. See you later. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Julie. Oh, sure. Yeah.